head with me as we pray. Our God, we thank you that Jesus became our lamb, that Jesus sacrificed himself so that by his wounds we might be healed. We thank you for that sacrifice, Lord, and I pray now that you would speak through me, that these words that I speak might not be my own, but Lord, they might be yours, that they would touch all of our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. About two weeks ago, I was driving, driving down the highway, when a rock hit our windshield. It was one of those times, you know, you're driving right behind this big semi truck and you hear the pop. Kathleen was in the car. Our dog was in the car too. And I think instinctively, all three of us just kind of ducked. <laughs> There's nothing you can really do about it. But for some reason, you see that thing flying at you, you hear the pop and you just, something about it, you just duck out of the way, just subconsciously. It was a big rock. We actually saw it. Sometimes you don't even see it, but we saw it coming at us. And so you do what we always do, you know, you hear the pop. You start looking around, okay, you know, where did it hit? Did it leave a chip? Did it leave a crack? Where is it? Where is it? And oh, there it is, sure enough, right down by the windshield, you could see the little spot and already about five fingers of crack kind of radiating off of it. Okay, oh boy, here we go. So it was the weekend, so we got it in as quickly as we could to make sure, you know, it didn't spread anymore. You know, you take it into the glass repair people so they don't, uh, they, they do a little filling in it so it, it won't keep spreading. And so I took it into this place and you know, called around, found a place in Bellevue where they had an opening. Um, and I tell you, almost half of the people in Seattle must have gotten chips in their windshield <laughs> that weekend because that place was packed. Uh, it's just a simple little thing that they do, you know, but it took, it was over, I was waiting for over an hour, probably an hour and a half. I was there and the, the waiting room was full to the point where they had the spot outside where people were waiting for their windshields to be fixed as well. It was just completely full. And when I, you know, checked my car in to have the chip fixed, they gave me this little talk. And because I was waiting there for a long time and because people were just coming in, coming in, coming in, I heard this talk multiple times as all these people were checking in their cars. And they told me this thing. They said, well, okay, we're going to take care of it, but I want you to know that what we do does not erase the crack, right? You know, there's still gonna be a little chip there. The, what we do is we make sure that it doesn't spread. So we, we fill it, you know, we prevent any more cracks from forming, but don't be surprised if you still see a little something there, we're not going to erase it. And, you know, sure enough, when I got my car back, when they were finally done, they did a really good job. One of the best little, uh, chip fillings that I've ever had. But even so, yeah, if you look, you can see, yep, there was a, a chip there in the windshield. And so I'd, I'd had this done before, so I wasn't surprised when they told me this. But you could tell as I was listening to other people coming through the line that some people were a little bit annoyed by that. Like, what do you mean? You know, I, I'm bringing this car into you to, to fix my windshield. You're telling me it's not going to be fixed? And they'd say, well, you know, sir, you know, it, it, well, we're fixing it, but we can't completely make it new. There's still going to be a little, and they were a little bit upset by that. And me being a pastor, you know, this is the way my mind thinks, I started to apply this to our experience of salvation and what it's like to, to join the church and to give our life to Christ. Because I've baptized people who after they had you know, come up out of the water, and I've talked to people, other people who I didn't baptize, but who had this experience, they come up out of the water after baptism, and maybe a week goes by, maybe a month, and they'll come to their pastor and they say, Pastor, we were expecting a clean windshield. We were expecting when I came up out of the water that the temptations would be gone, that the struggles that I faced day to day, I thought that after baptism that they'd be gone. But I come up out of the water and I, it's this wonderful experience. I, I feel the love of God, but a day passes, maybe two, maybe three. And I, I start to experience those same thought patterns that I had before. I start to experience those same temptations that I had before. I start to experience the same hardships that I had before. Did something go wrong? Why isn't my windshield clean again? People who come up out of the water after baptism, surprised to find that there are still cracks in the windshield. 
And so today I want to talk about our cracks. And I want to talk about what it means to be perfect as a Christian. And specifically, I want to talk about the difference between perfectionism on the one hand and Christian perfection. So perfectionism versus Christian perfection. And so to understand what I mean by perfectionism, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 17. Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 17, and I will be reading the first four verses. So 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. I find here a perfect example of perfectionism, which ends up being the antithesis, the opposite of true Christian perfection. 2 Kings 17, I'll read verses 1 through 4. Eventually, I'll read verses 1 and 2 now. 2 Kings 17 says, In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel who preceded him. Now, if you ever had to memorize the, the kings of Israel, or if you enjoy yourself some Bible trivia, the name Hoshea might ring a bell to you. Because Hoshea, as the king of Israel, is actually one of the more infamous kings of Israel. But not because he was necessarily wicked, as it says in verse 2. He did, not, he did evil, but not like the kings, who uh, the kings of Israel who preceded him. So he wasn't an Ahab. He wasn't a Jeroboam, you know, he wasn't one of these kings who were bringing lots of idols, lots of impurities, uh, lots of detestable practices into Israel. He wasn't infamous for that reason. No, Hoshea is infamous because we know what happened during his reign. Hoshea was the last king of Israel. That's the reason he's infamous. We're talking about Israel, remember, the northern ten tribes, the, the kingdom of Judah, was separate at this time, and it lasted a little bit longer. But the kingdom of Israel was conquered, defeated by the Assyrian kingdom, led into captivity, never to be seen again. And it was Hoshea who was the king of Israel when this all went down. And so he has the infamous title of being the last king of Israel, the king of Israel who reigned over the defeat to Assyria. How did that happen? What happened? Well, before we get into that, there's some irony here, because Hoshea did not become king like most people become king. You know, normally in kingdoms, when a king dies, his son, the prince, becomes king. It's normal line of succession, right? This is the way normally kingdoms work. But that is not how Hoshea became king. Hoshea's father was never a king. Instead, there was a king called Pekah, who Hoshea led a rebellion against. The text actually says that Hoshea saw that Pekah was assassinated. So Hoshea represents a kind of regime change. He said, you know, Pekah is not doing a good job. I could do better than he is. So I'm going to make myself king instead. You know, in the world today, anytime there's any kind of regime change, whether it's because of an election or a civil war or a coup, you know, around the world we see different people taking power. And at first the hope is always the same, isn't it? Well, maybe this government, maybe this political party will, will, will save our problems, will save our country, will be the solution to what's wrong with our kingdom. And you can imagine as Hoshea takes the throne that the children of Israel thought the same way. Well, Pekah was no good, maybe this new guy, maybe he, will lead our kingdom into prosperity. And the, the double cherry on top here is that the name Hoshea literally means salvation. Hoshea means salvation. And so here comes this new king, this new kingdom, this new regime with a guy who literally is called salvation. And you think to yourself, well, surely this man is going to lead our kingdom in a good way. He's going to save our kingdom. He's going to make our kingdom prosperous. So here comes Hoshea, named salvation, a new regime. He's going to save Israel? Well, not quite. We keep reading in verses 3 and 4. It says, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hoshea. 
who had been, uh, uh, sorry, Hoshea, who had been Shalmaneser's vassal and had paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria discovered that Hoshea was a traitor, for he had sent envoys to So, king of Egypt, and he no longer paid tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore, Shalmaneser seized him and put him in prison. And this ends up being the, end, the beginning of the end. As Hoshea is put in prison, um, this king Shalmaneser of Assyria begins to then wipe off all of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so what happens? Here's Hoshea. He, he considers himself to be the salvation of Israel. He's going to make things better. And so he finds Israel in a place where they are constantly having to bribe Assyria. We're going to pay you money, Assyria, so that you don't conquer us. That's what this tribute is for. We're going to keep paying you year after year, most of our prophets in the entire country being funneled away into Assyria just so that they would not be attacked. And so you can imagine Hoshea comes and he says, well, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to make life better for Israel. And so, well, what's one way that we could make life better? Well, let's stop sending all of our money to Assyria. Let's try to save some of that wealth for ourselves. And so Hoshea comes up with a plan. He's going to go bargain hunting. <laughs> he says, Assyria is too expensive. It's taking all of our money. Let's see if we can pay Egypt a little bit less and get the same result. We'll save some money. We'll make ourselves a little bit more prosperous. And then Egypt can protect us. We'll still be peaceful, but we'll have a little bit more money. What could go wrong? Well, turns out two things. <laughs> There are two reasons why Hoshea's plan didn't work. One political or historical and one spiritual. From a historical perspective, this was a bad idea because at the time, Egypt itself was in a state of chaos. If you've ever studied Egyptian history, you know that the Egyptian history is separated by dynasties. We talk about the first dynasty, the second dynasty, the third dynasty, these periods of time where these very strong rulers would rule over Egypt and, and make it a very prosperous and, and very powerful country. But at the time of Hoshea, they were in between dynasties. One dynasty had fallen, another dynasty had not yet asserted itself. And so Egypt at the time was in the midst of this political turmoil while different generals, different nobles, different powerful rich people of the country were fighting amongst themselves to gain power of Egypt. And so Egypt was in no, uh, no position to save another country. They could barely save themselves. They were fighting amongst themselves. So historically, yes, this was a bad idea. But also spiritually. Hoshea makes a mistake here. Because at the time, Hoshea is king of Israel. Hezekiah is king of Judah. And if you remember Hezekiah's story, it's very similar to Hoshea's. Assyria comes charging in, trying to capture Jerusalem. And Hezekiah also sends some envoys to Egypt to try to say, hey, can you help us out? But Hezekiah does something that Hoshea doesn't. Because Hezekiah also puts his trust in God. Hoshea puts his entire hope, his entire trust, he stakes his claim on another country. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go all in on Egypt here. I'm going to assume that I can figure out a way to save my country on my own. That is Hoshea's mistake. And in fact, in prophecies, if you read the prophetic Bible, uh, the prophetic works in the Old Testament, the prophets start to use Egypt in this prophetic sense. If you read in the, in the prophetic books, Babylon often represents false worship, idolatry, and then Egypt represents trying to do it yourself, trying to say, I have these problems. I don't need God. I can figure things out for myself. And at the heart of it, this is what fuels perfectionism. Perfectionistic tendencies within us is that thing that says that if I just try harder, if I just kind of grit my teeth and, and do a little bit better, if I set reminders on my phone from time to time, I can figure out a way to do better on my own. It's like Hoshea sending envoys to Egypt when he could have just prayed to God for deliverance. And so the problem is we find ourselves in a world, in a country where do-it-yourselfism is a religion, right? 
You're expected to be able to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You're expected to be able to be self-reliant. You're expected to be able to improve. And if you don't, society looks down on you. And so we are taught day after day in our society to be self-reliant. But self-reliance leads only to a perfectionism that will ultimately fail us. Ellen White says this. This is a devotional book, Upward Look, page 353. Ellen White says, what does God require? Perfection. Nothing less than perfection. But if we would be perfect, we must put no confidence in self. Daily, we must know and understand that self is not to be trusted. We need to grasp God's promises with firm faith. We need to ask for the Holy Spirit with a full realization that our own, uh, a full realization of our own helplessness. Then when the Holy Spirit works, we shall not give self the glory. And so rather than uh, default to these perfectionistic tendencies of trying to only do better on our own, Sister White is saying here that yes, we need to improve. Yes, perfection is the goal, but we cannot do it by ourselves. We cannot look to Egypt to save us. We cannot go to the self-help section of our local library or of our Barnes and Noble or something and find the book, find the, the one mentality that somehow will, will break us free from those patterns of thought, patterns of action that we want to get rid of. No, the only way that we can experience true transformation, the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the Holy Spirit is a free gift. It is offered to us freely if we would but accept it. But the problem is it is so difficult for us sometimes to die to self, to, to sacrifice our own desires and to accept that free gift. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 18, because I want to pick this apart a little bit. Why is it so hard for us to accept what is essentially a free gift? the gift of grace, the gift of salvation, the gift of a transformed life. Matthew 18, and we'll look at the parable that starts in verse 23. So Matthew 18, verse 23. Now this is the parable of the unmerciful servant or the ungrateful servant. The context here is, is Peter comes up to Jesus and he thinks he's being very generous, very charitable, and he asks, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? seven times, feeling pretty good about that, thinking seven's a lot. <laughs> and Jesus tells him, well, you're off by about 100, <laughs> 70 times seven. And then he tells this parable about why we should forgive. And in the parable, there's a servant who owes the king an immeasurable amount of wealth. The text says here in uh, verse 24 now, of Matthew 18, now 24, that this servant owed the king 10,000 talents. Now, a talent wasn't a coin, it wasn't a dollar, it was a unit of weight, okay? And it doesn't say talents of silver, talents of gold, but ten, a, a talent was about 60 pounds, so 10,000 talents was roughly about 300 tons. And to put that into perspective, that is the weight of a Boeing 747 jet. So are we talking about a Boeing 7047 of silver or of gold? It doesn't matter. It's a lot of money. <laughs> That's kind of the point here. It's more than anyone could ever hope to pay. This is the larger than the GDP of all of Palestine that we're talking about here. So in other words, an innumerable, immeasurable sum of wealth. And in those times, if someone owed a debt that they couldn't pay, the first choice would be to put that person in prison. And it was kind of like crowdfunding today. Do you ever see on like GoFundMe or Kickstarter or something where someone is going to crowdfund? It was that idea where one person would be put in prison and then the family, the friends, the people who cared for and loved that person would try to raise money to pay off that debt to get him out of prison. That's the way indebtedness would normally work during Jesus's day. But this servant, we are led to believe, owed so much money that there was no way that any of even his friends or his family or his family's family or his friends, 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 friends could have raised that much money. And so rather than put him in prison, the parable says that he is going to be sold into slavery, not to pay off the debt, even that would not have paid off his debt, but just 
a drop in the bucket to try to get some money back. It says in verse 26, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with, he, uh, with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Notice that. I will pay back everything. Right, we're talking about perfectionism versus Christian perfection here. He still has this idea that if you just give me enough time, I can sort things out on my own. We know that's impossible. Verse 27, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. So this servant receives grace. He experiences firsthand what it means to have mercy from God being offered to him freely. But then what happens? That servant goes and he finds another servant, another servant who owes him some money. And in today's currency, this debt might be around $20,000. So, I mean, it's still a lot of money, but it's not Boeing 747 jet money, <laughs> you know? It's not that much. And so you would think to yourself, well, surely the servant, if you were just received this, all this forgiveness, if you were forgiven a Boeing 747 worth of silver or of gold, why do you care so much about this amount of money? And yet the scripture says that this servant choked and was flogging the servant and was going to have him put in prison. And the point of the parable is that if we who have been forgiven so much, we have been forgiven so much, surely we also should forgive each other, right? That's the point of the parable, that we should have a forgiving spirit towards one another because we have experienced that grace. That's the main point of the parable. But I want to focus on that first servant. Now, we don't know if this parable actually happened. It's kind of hard to believe that someone could have actually racked up that much debt. But what was going through that first servant's mind? Why was he acting so strangely? He had just received this forgiveness. Why, why was he beating up his fellow servant after he, had after he had received such grace? I can think of a few reasons. And the scripture doesn't tell us, so this is a bit of conjecture. But I think all of the reasons make the point. One reason was that he didn't truly believe that his debt was forgiven was that he thought that, okay, yeah, he says that now, he says that my debt is forgiven, but just wait, a day is coming when he's gonna call my debt up again, and when that day happens, I need to be ready. So I'm gonna go and scrounge up as much money as I could. So in other words, he is acting as though the grace that he received was still conditional. He was acting as though the mercy that he received was not true mercy. He did not believe that the grace that he had been shown could possibly be true. That's one possibility. Or possibly he understood that yes, his debt had been forgiven, but he couldn't bear that fact. He couldn't bear the fact that he could not do it on his own, that he needed grace, that he needed forgiveness. The, the, the attitude of perfectionism was still strong in him. And so because he was angry at the fact that he needed mercy, he took that anger out on his fellow servant. Whichever option we choose, whichever way we think is most likely the, the mentality of this servant, the cause is the same, an inability to accept God's grace, an inability to say that, yes, God has truly forgiven me, an, Ill, an, in, an inability, excuse me, an inability to say, I trust in Jesus to save me. I trust in God. I trust in the Holy Spirit to change me from the inside out. That lingering thought in the mind that says, I can do it on my own. Think about the rich young ruler. When he comes to Jesus, what does he say? What must I do to be saved? That's his attitude, right? What can I do to be saved? And we know as we read the gospel that there's nothing he can do. It's what Jesus does that saves him and what saves us, right? It's the sacrifice of Jesus, the perfect life lived by Jesus, the sacrifice, the resurrection, his continuing ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. It is Jesus who saves us. There's nothing that we can do. And so what does Jesus tell the rich young ruler? Go, sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Now, does he tell him that because you can buy your way into heaven if you just sell enough stuff, if you just give enough stuff away? Does that earn your entrance in, into salvation? No. I believe Jesus told him that because if he were to do it, we know that he didn't. 
The scripture says he goes away sad. But if he, the ruler had really gone and done what Jesus told him to do, for the first time in that rich young ruler's life, he would have had to depend on God and not self. And so Jesus was telling him, you need to learn dependence. You need to learn that you cannot be a perfectionist. You cannot do this on your own. So you need to get rid of it all and learn to depend on me. Think about in the story of Acts, when Simon Magus, Simon Magus uh, sees the apostles doing these amazing miracles by the Holy Spirit. They're healing, they're casting out demons. And Simon, he sees this and he goes up to the apostles and what does he say? He pulls out his wallet and he says, all right, how much? I wanna buy this from you. Not realizing and not being able to accept the Holy Spirit also as a free gift from God. There must be a catch. There must be something that I need to pay in order to earn my way into this amazing thing that I see in front of me. But the problem with that thinking is that no matter what we do, it will never be good enough. Like Hoshea, we can appeal to Egypt time and time again, but it will never be good enough. There is a famous atheist who wrote a book, you know, railing against God, railing against religion. And during one of his kind of tours where he's promoting his book, a reporter asked him, you know, you talk a lot about God in your book and how bad God is and all this stuff. When you talk about God, what do you mean by God? When you think about God, he's asking this atheist, when you think God, what do you mean by that? And the atheist answered, God? He said, God to me is that inner voice that always says, that's not quite good enough. And that's the mentality that people sometimes associate with religion, sometimes associate with their own life, that no matter what they do, it's not quite good enough. And we learn this kind of perfectionistic mindset from all over the place. Maybe we were raised by parents where whatever we did wasn't quite good enough. Maybe we had friends where we had to act a certain way in order to be accepted, teaching us that we had to earn their love, their trust. Maybe we had a romantic partners in the past for whom their love was clearly conditional. However it is, we are inundated with this mindset of conditional love where we have to earn our way into grace. That's just not quite good enough. And when we have this mindset within us, it's hard to accept that free gift of grace. You know, Paul preached grace to the Galatian church, and they couldn't accept it. They turned to Judaism, they turned to ceremonialism, because they thought there must be something else we can do. Paul preached, uh, preached grace to the Colossian church, and they turned to asceticism. They had to fast more, they had to cut out certain things from their diet. They had to do something because surely grace can't be that good. But grace is a free gift. And the difference between perfectionism and Christian perfection is wholly relying on Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bibles. We're still in Matthew, if you still have it open, but Matthew 11 now. Matthew 11, and we'll read verses 28 through 30. Matthew 11, 28, 29, and 30. Matthew 11, 30, uh, Matthew 11, 28 to begin with, Jesus says this, come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We can strive and strive and strive to carry our own burdens or we can give it all to God and take up his burden instead. Now, some of you might say to yourself, now, pastor, are you preaching cheap grace here? Are we talking about just, you know, name it and claim it? I just say the words and boom, I'm saved and I can do whatever I want. Well, no, not quite. Because notice in these verses, he doesn't say that there's no yoke. He doesn't say that there's no burden. He says that we are taking on the yoke of Christ. We're taking on Jesus's burden. And what that means is that when we give ourselves to Jesus, he will begin to change us. And so transformation does happen, but it's not because of what we do. It's not this perfectionistic idea that we're gonna take this cracked windshield and we're just gonna buff it out ourselves. 
No, we give it all to Jesus. We take up his yoke and he begins to heal those cracks for us. In Christ's object lessons, verse 331, by the way, if you like Christ's object lessons, we are reading through it in prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. We'd love to have you if you don't normally join us, seven o'clock. But Christ's object lessons, this comes from 331, page 331. Ellen White says this, but Christ has given us no assurance that to attain perfection of character is an easy matter. A noble all-around character is not inherited. It does not come by accident. A noble character is earned by individual effort through the merits and grace of Christ. It is formed by hard, stern battles with self. Conflict after conflict must be waged against hereditary tendencies. And I love this quote because it's a balance. She's saying there, there's two ditches that you could fall into, and she's arguing against both. She's saying, number one, it's not that we can do it ourselves. She very clearly says it's the merits and grace of Christ that brings transformation into our life. But she's also saying that it's not just you say the words once, you come up out of the water, and suddenly it's a perfect windshield, right? She says, well, we form that character by hard, stern battles with self. Conflict after conflict must be waged. So she's talking about this life lived with Christ. That as we walk with Christ day by day, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is starting to wipe away those cracks. It doesn't happen in an instant. I've, I've baptized people who were pack-a-day smokers. And when they came up out of the water, it was like that. The cravings were gone. And that is a miracle, and that happens sometimes. But I've also baptized people who are pack-a-day smokers, and when they came up out of the water, they had to go on the gum. They used the patches. They had to go to meetings. They backslid a few times. And then finally, after years of effort of, of praying and working with God, finally, they were free from cravings. And you know what, congregation? That's a miracle, too. God works through us, but, but what God does with you is going to look a little bit different than what he does with me. My cracks are not your cracks. This, uh, this quarterly, if you've been attending Sabbath school, we've been going through the, the book of Genesis. And we know that in the book of Genesis, we see godly people who nonetheless had cracks, didn't they? Abraham had a trust issue. He had a hard time trusting God. Jacob had a, a truthfulness issue. He had a hard time telling the truth sometimes. Uh, we go forward, uh, Exodus, Moses had an anger problem. And you can imagine if they somehow all lived together, Abraham pointing to Moses and saying, Moses, you know, you have a really bad anger problem. And Moses saying, me? Well, you have a bad trust problem. Our cracks are not going to look the same. What is the same is the God who is working with us, the God who is saving us. For our last verse today, I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll read verses 17 and 18, the last two verses of that chapter. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 17 and 18, Paul writes, But let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commands. This process of walking with God, of sanctification, of being perfected through our journey with Christ, that is so one day when the cracks start to fade, we don't say, look what I did. We say, God is good. We say, look what God has done, not by anything that I have done, but because he is a good and faithful Lord. I'm going to show a video here, and it's kind of hard to hear the audio, so I'm going to tell you ahead of time what we're going to see, so that at least when we're watching, you can understand what's happening. But this is a video of a man who has won gold medals in sprinting for the Paralympics, um, and he is completely blind, can't see a thing. And so you might wonder, well, how can that be? How can you run and run and run without knowing where you're going? And he does it because uh, an ex-Olympian, an, an able body, he, he has his full sight, partnered with him, trained with him, so that when this blind man runs in the Olympics, this other man is running step by step with him. 
And I want you to watch the video and specifically when they're running, watch their steps. It's just amazing to watch how in step they are together and think about what those two are able to accomplish as they run together. Now let's go ahead and put that video on the screen. We can try to be perfect on our own, but we end up just running in circles. We can't see the finish line. We don't know where to go. Perfectionism only becomes perfection when we, like that, are partnered with Christ. When we are walking alongside Christ day by day, step after step, it is through Christ that we become changed. That is my hope for all of us today, that we would walk like that. Doesn't always look quite like that, does it? <laughs> sometimes we misstep, sometimes we stumble. It's not God's fault, it's ours. But that we would pick ourselves up and again, start running with Christ. And we won't always see transformation immediately. But as we look back after a month, after a year, after a decade, we will just marvel as it says in 2 Corinthians, we will give all glory to God who has changed us from the inside out. Our closing hymn for today is the hymn, I Know Whom I Have Believed. And it talks about the mystery of God and all the wonders that he does. And the fact that even if we can't fully understand sometimes who God is and, and how he is able to do what he does, what we do know is that he is a loving God. And that what we are asked to do is to know him personally. So I invite you all to stand as we sing our closing hymn, I Know Whom I Have Believed. Potluck immediately after the service. I hope to see you there. Now let's bow our heads. Our Father, we acknowledge that like Hoshea, sometimes we run to Egypt. Sometimes we try to do these things on our own. And Lord, we repent of those times and acknowledge that it is only through you that we can have true change in our life. Mm -hmm. Like the video that we saw, Lord, we want to be step in step with you, walking with you every day. Lord, I ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Guide us in our lives as we go from this place. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.